so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Damon Silvers. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an advisor to the American Trade Union Movement, to the AFL-CIO and the American Federation of Teachers. And I'm a visiting professor at University College London uh, at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Um, I'm going, I have prepared remarks, and the reason why they are prepared is so that I stick within time. <laughs> and, uh, and let me first say that uh, some of what you're about to hear is actually repetitive of what you've already heard. Uh, that, I, I think, is testimony to the notion that we actually have a lot of common thinking going on here. We didn't, coor we didn't choreograph the fact that I'm going to repeat what a number of people have said. Um, so um, whether we know it or not, this talks about labor, but it's about some larger themes uh, as well. Uh, and that's sort of where the repetition comes in. Um, whether we know it or not, uh, most of us were taught in school that property precedes government. And in fact, that government's purpose is, is to exist to protect property. And now that is the core of John Locke's second treatise on government, which is a text that is basic, it's fundamental to most courses in political science and political thought that are taught in the English-speaking world. And by the way, speaking of the uh, really powerful speakers we heard at the beginning of this event, that text is a fundamental text in the ideology of conquest and of commodification. And we'll come to that in a little bit more detail. Now, this way of thinking underpins the habits of mind of the American courts. And, and please listen to what I mean, what I, the words I use, the habits of mind, not the actual texts, Right? Not, not the words, but the, the assumptions of American courts through much of our history. And it led in the distant past to a whole theory of law, substantive due process, which claimed that our Constitution entirely prohibited economic regulation, and in particular, the regulation of labor markets. And uh, this is really uh, a lot of what Katerina was referring to when she talked about the Constitution protects property. Now, this is despite the fact that the word property appears in the United States Constitution exactly three times. And one of those three times is, refers to the fact that the federal government has the right to manage its own property. So in terms of the use of the word property in a larger context, it appears twice. And I'll come back to that in a moment. In neither case are we told what it means. Now, more than any other body of law, property law has been the realm of explicit or implicit natural law thinking. Natural law thinking is the idea that property rights are part of the natural order that they derive from God or from Plato's forms or they're intrinsic to human reason somehow and are thus beyond the reach of political and democratic processes. Now in the first decades of the 20th century, there was an intellectual revolution in American law that was the foundation for the New Deal revolution in public policy. And we heard about that briefly uh, uh, earlier uh, um, on the screen. At the core of this revolution called, called legal realism was the assertion that property rights were not prior to the state. They were not prior to politics. They were in fact the creation of politics. And that the enforcement of property rights by the state was not the protection of freedom, but a form of coercion. Whether or not one thought that any particular approach to property rights was a good thing or a bad thing, that the core concept of property rights, whatever they were, was inherently and necessarily coercive. Now, legal realists were particularly interested in the idea that the intersection of property rights with the reality of wage labor was particularly coercive that there was no such thing as freedom of contract in labor law when landless laborers were prevented by property laws from growing their own food. We so internalized the nature of these legal coercions and the fact that the police and ultimately the army will enforce them that we don't even see they are around us. Freedom of contract means in that particular situation, the landless laborer being offered a, sub, a starvation wage, the land freedom of contract means in that situation, the freedom to starve. Now this argument is laid out very succinctly, and I urge you to read, to read it if you have a moment, in the article 
that was put on the screen a few minutes ago by Columbia law professor Robert Hale in 1923, 100 years ago, called coercion and distribution in a supposedly non-coercive state. One of the most important pieces of intellectual work in the history of the United States and almost forgotten. The idea that we are not a republic of natural laws, but a republic of citizens, a republic where we co-create, and here I am, here I am taking the key words uh, of my colleague at, at the University of London, Mariana Mazzucato, that we co-create markets and we co-create property relations. That, and, and that idea, that idea underpins all of our labor laws. The Fair Labor Standards Act, it provides for the minimum wage, child labor bans, the National Labor Relations Act, and all that follows. These laws were not passed to be subordinate to property law, but to modify it. And yet, over time, they have been interpreted over and over again by the courts as somehow limited by something called property rights, mediated through the due process clauses of the Constitution, which are the only two places in the Constitution that the word property is mentioned. Over and over again, labor law has been seen as uniquely constrained by property rights, as if there was somehow something suspect about our labor laws, that they were a kind of second-class statutory regime subordinate to the real laws that are about protecting this thing called property rights that are popularly enacted statutes. This idea in particular rests on a trick the trick that the word property in the due process clauses of the 5th and 14th Amendments refers to a fixed body of substantive law, something, something etched in concrete somewhere, as opposed to a bundle of rights, responsibilities, and relationships that are constantly changing. The whole notion of what property was was changing at the time of the drafting of the Constitution and has been in flux from that day till now. And by the way, if you're curious about this, the degree to which the meaning of property itself was in flux during the 19th century is the subject of a huge multi-volume study by Morton Horowitz called The Transformation of American Law. Now, how has labor law been undermined here by property law or by what judges think property law is? Some examples. In the Supreme Court's Lechmere Stores case, the Supreme Court found that businesses which were generally open to the public could ban union organizers from their property. A case that had a huge impact, Leachmere Stores is a long gone big box store, a case that had a huge impact on union organizing in the largest single sector of the US labor market, retail stores, and that defined the shopping mall as a public private space, as opposed to the, the, the commercial streets of the mid-century US city. The Darlington Industries case, where the Fourth Circuit found it was beyond the power of the National Labor Relations Board to order an employer who had, sh who had shut their factory to avoid unionization, largest employer in South Carolina, by the way, if you're interested in why South Carolina is the way it is, they had shut their factory in order to avoid unionization, that the courts could not order them to reopen, even though the motive was clearly illegal, because that would place too great a burden on property rights. A finding that had no textual support anywhere, not in the Constitution nor in any statute. And the result was to essentially draw a map as to how, it, how you could completely undercut and destroy the promises made in U.S. labor law. And of course, the general principle that employers have a right to engage in coercive conduct during a union organizing drive, holding captive audience meetings and excluding vocal union supporters from those meetings, is clearly rooted in notions of employer property rights. The idea that I can do what I want in my workplace, regardless of what the law says. Interesting, one area where this, one area where this kind of thinking has not grown in American law recently, and until very recently, is the interpretation of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which is actually substantially a labor law, a law about work. Much of the original opposition to the 64 Act was in the form of the following thought, quote, and this is what Barry Goldwater said, this is not a quote from him, but this is the kind of thing he would say, employers have the right to be racist in hiring decisions because they own their businesses, and that is part of their property rights to decide to have, who they want to have work for them. The idea that property rights 
Trump's our right to be free of racial discrimination has not gotten very far yet, except that it is now sneaking in the back door around claims for a combination of property rights and religious freedom in relation to LGBTQ rights. Now, in order to rebuild American democracy and restore a level of social solidarity to American society, we need to revive the legal realist understanding of property and markets, not as somehow a priori, but as social, political, and legal creations. And nowhere is this need for this kind of revival more important than in labor markets. And nowhere should it be easier. We have a deep-seated misunderstanding about the law of real property. The misunderstanding that the law of real property is about our relationship with objects. As I was taught long ago by a really brilliant sociologist of slavery, Orlando Patterson, property is about our relationship, not with objects, but with other people. And no area of the law is, more, is this more obvious than in the law of labor and employment, which governs relationships between employers and employees and among employees in the case of labor law. It should not be too hard to understand the law of employer-employee relationships as contingent, as subject to change by courts and legislatures, subject to modernization, to strengthening or weakening. In America today, we need to recognize that Locke's account is ideology. The ideology of foreclosure in England and of conquest in the New World. That Locke was playing a trick on posterity, describing something brand new in his time, commodified land, as a marketable asset as though it had existed forever. But in response, we need not to destroy property, but to reform it in a way that makes it not the master of democratic society, but the servant. That accommodates a political economy that can provide both broad-based prosperity and a sense of popular voice and of efficacy and a sense of social solidarity and social trust that we are bound to one another and can trust one another. And this reformation needs to start with labor law. And I believe it needs to start, here comes my specific idea, with the proposition that when people come together in a workplace, be that workplace physical or virtual, to work, they have the right to elect the representatives to bargain with their employer. Not the choice, not the option if their employer acquiesces, not something they have to fight for 10 years for in the courts, but the right. Much as the owner of the workplace has rights associated with his claim of ownership over the place of work or the tools of work. And if I might conclude with this thought, the transformation we need does not require we amend the Constitution. Our Constitution does not incorporate the common law of property. It does not incorporate property as it was frozen in the minds of John Locke or Thomas Jefferson, for that matter. Rather, it is part of our general legal framework and, be, and can be changed by statute, including statute that reg, statutes that regulate the labor market. The transformation our society needs simply requires that judges, and most of all Supreme Court justices, free their minds quote George Clinton, free their minds from the shackles of natural law thought when they read our Constitution, much as the Supreme Court originally did when it overturned substantive due process and found that minimum wage laws were constitutional after all in 1937. We need to turn our natural law thinking upside down to realize that in many ways, our labor laws tell us what our property laws mean, not vice versa, or at, le or at least that's how things need to work if we want our democracy to last. Thank you so much.